All right, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on why a robust offsetting strategy is essential to your net zero transition. So uh, my name is John Powers. I'm Global Vice President of Renewable Energy and Carbon Advisory at Schneider Electric. And I couldn't be more thrilled uh, to welcome our colleagues from ECOACT and the experts in the space to help lead this webinar. So uh, ECOACT, uh, for those who don't know, ECOACT as a part of Schneider Electric as of 2023. Uh, but the company was founded in 2006 and is an international sustainability consultant and a project developer of nature and technology-based solutions or carbon offsets. So um, really one of the longtime industry leader leaders in this space. So we're very excited to have them uh, as part of the Schneider family and, and very excited to, to share some of the expertise um, with this community. So uh, I know that many people dialing into the call uh, are have or are setting sustainability goals. Perhaps you have a science-based target or you're considering it. Some of you may even have a net zero target like Schneider ourselves has. Uh, and you're, you're starting to think through that. And as you get to that last mile, boy, how are we really gonna get to net zero? Uh, as you start to really dig into that, you know, the low hanging fruit's been harvested carbon offsetting becomes a, a really important part of that story and that puzzle. Um, but I, I'm sure everyone has seen uh, various press on carbon offsetting in the news recently, some of it positive, some of it negative. Um, so how do you know, if you know this is gonna be an important part of the strategy, how do you ensure that the projects you're investing in really have that impact that you're seeking to drive? The last thing any of us want is to be called greenwashers. We really wanna be supporting nature and technology-based solutions that are positively impacting the climate, that are removing or avoiding emissions that are really verifiable and the highest quality. So I'm really excited for uh, the EcoAx team to, to kind of talk us through, how do you get your head around that? How do you, how do you figure out what, you know, uh, what are the right types of offsets to look at? Um, you know, how do you get comfortable with that? And, and how do you make those decisions? So Without further ado, I will turn it over to Murray and the EcoAct team to further introduce EcoAct as a business and, and the team. So Murray, over to you. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, you're gonna hear from EcoAct experts today. You're gonna hear from Xander. He's a, he's a senior consultant uh, in leading the carbon credit advisory team in EcoAct. Harry Parking, he is uh, leading the carbon offsetting service um, in EcoAct, also from Elisa. Uh, he She is our blue carbon project development manager. And finally, um, you will also listen a few words from me. I am the Portfolio and Partnerships Regional Manager for the UK. Um, in terms of the agenda, we have different topics to walk you through today, um, going from the latest developments of the voluntary carbon market, um, kind of explaining what are the key steps when building a robust carbon offsetting strategy, how to build um, a credible strategy. And also we we want to wrap up by giving you a taste of, of some of the projects that we have uh, developed as EcoAct. Um, a reminder for the attendees today, the recording of this webinar will be shared with all participants. And if you have any questions uh, throughout, uh, throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom. You're going to find it um, in the Q&A icon in, in Zoom. And at the end of the webinar, we're going to have um, a few minutes uh, to address those. Um, so a, just to give you a, a little bit of more of context of who ECOACT is, uh, we are in international climate and nature consultancy and project developer with uh, more than 18 years years of experience in the industry um, with more than 360 uh, climate experts globally. We have extensive experience in working on net zero transitions, climate risk management, and uh, sustainability projects. We have a dedicated team um, of specialists that are focused primarily on the voluntary carbon market, developing and but also sourcing uh, those projects. There is also an expert team, um, integrated climate science, climate modeling, and data analytics for, um, for actionable insights. Um, data analytics is a key role in, in ECOAT services. Um, 
without further ado, I think we can start and jump straight into the into into the topic uh, of today. Um, and I wanted to start by giving you a little bit of context of what has happened in the voluntary carbon market recently. As you know, it's it's a market that is in uh, under continuous. Um, evolution um, and many actors uh, take an active part in in these improvements around the voluntary carbon market. So let's first start by saying why climate action is important, and it's because science has spoken. Really, um, we need to have. Uh, emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050 to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees. The IPCC in says that it is, it this is needed and there is no more time to left. Um, the UNDP has, has also uh, said that in order to be on track, our annual emissions must be reduced by 45% compared to what was what is expected in plan under current policies. And we have also seen that being materialized and reflected in the various announcements um, after the COP28 um, in last uh, at the end of last year, with uh, with the announcement of the loss and damage fund, an increased uh, climate finance uh, movement, but also the COP28, the presidency, uh, strengthen the importance of collaborating among governments and other non-state actors to mobilize that climate finance, to improve climate action plans, and 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 corporates play a key role in that transition. Um, Alongside the emission reduction activities of an organization, carbon credits are required to meet uh, to meet these uh, net zero targets. Um, and just moving on to the role of carbon credits and climate action, there have been uh, at the end of last year there were two uh, important reports that showcase the relevance and the importance of incorporating um, climate finance and the use of carbon credits or market-based instruments in the carbonization strategies of organizations. Um, it reports from Ecosystem Marketplace and MSCI Carbon Markets showed that companies that are involved in the VCM um, and they're using carbon credits, uh, they are decarbonizing faster than those on, uh, that don't use any. Companies that include those uh, carbon credits in their strategies are able to reduce emissions twice as quickly, and they're almost twice as likely to work on emission reduction each year and more likely to collaborate with suppliers, showing a broader uh, commitment to climate action that involves uh, suppliers, employees, but also customers. And Additionally, what we have seen as part of those reports is that companies purchasing voluntary carbon credits invest three times more in reducing emissions throughout the, their supply chains because of this uh, because of this engagement. It's not only reducing emissions, but also collecting better data and knowing where those emissions uh, hotspots are coming from. Then, so. Carbon, the, the use of carbon credits, as I mentioned before, is a key instrument to driving uh, uh, carbon finance. This uh, is a tool to address existing global gaps, such as ambition. As I mentioned before, the current targets uh, put forward by countries are not enough to help us stay within the, our temperature goal. There is a timing limitation as well. We don't have time to lose. Um, and the use of uh, carbon finance can accelerate the deployment of those uh, resources into technologies that could deliver a short to mid-term um, mitigations, either reductions or removals. And then finally, they're a key driver uh, for finance to accelerate the investment in low carbon technologies, uh, therefore um, improving uh, and accelerating innovation as well. Um, according to other recent reports, um, uh, same from uh, MSCI Carbon Markets, there is, there is nearly 36 billion that have been invested in carbon credit projects between 2012 and 2022. Over 80% of those recent investments focus on nature-based solutions. This is showcasing the role that nature plays in all um, in all uh, emission reduction and in decarbonization strategies. Um, looking ahead, um, the um, UNDP um, has also published a, a report in the State of Finance for Nature in which uh, we need $8.1 trillion uh, by 2050 to address issues of climate, biodiversity, water, and land degradation. Um, we still need 90 billions of investment on carbon credits um, to reach that 1.5 goals by uh, temperature goal by 2030. 
Now, what is, what is the role of net zero in all this need of climate finance and accelerated climate action? So uh, EcoAct uh, believes that transformation requires a comprehensive and cyclical approach and that net zero is more than just a checkup in the decarbonization journey of, of a company. We believe in 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 that a decarbonization strategy of a company should uh, touch various aspects uh, that we define in our actor model. So first companies would need to assess and analyze uh, where what are those emissions uh, coming from, collect data, then be able to commit and contribute uh, and set up targets. Then um, it's not only committing and disclosing those targets, but it's also transitioning and transforming the, the, their businesses um, to then be able to contribute to further and enhance emission reductions and removals. And throughout this cyclical approach, it, climate finance and the use of carbon credits and the development of carbon projects plays a key uh, plays a key role um, in, 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 re, in staying within those planetary boundaries and enable the companies to have a, a data-driven um, strategy put in place. Um, now, I would like to hand it over to my colleague Sander to explain us how this a robust carbon offsetting strategy looks like. Perfect. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, just a quick reminder, if anyone has any questions, please send them in via the QA function at the bottom of the screen. So please send them in during. Um, but yeah, so I'm here to talk about what makes a robust uh, uh, offsetting strategy, why it's necessary for a net zero uh, target, and how you can ensure it is of good quality. So I want to start off with um, a statement that developing an offsetting strategy should form a core part of your transition planning. Um, and if we go back to 2021, offsetting residual emissions was established as a key part of achieving net zero by the SBTI corporate net zero standard, as we've referenced there at the bottom. So essentially what they were saying is that you need to set a net zero goal by a specific date, no later than 2050, reduced by 90%, and then offset your residual emissions. But it also stated something very interesting, which is due to the urgency and scale of the climate uh, climate crisis, they also noted the importance of abatement or removal of uh, beyond a company's value chain. So that is kind of offsetting um, currently emissions that are happening. And that has been um, kind of encouraged further. So in 2024, a couple of weeks ago, the SBTI released their BVCM guidance, which encourages all companies to take immediate and consistent action to deliver BVCM, so beyond value chain mitigation, essentially stating that, yes, it is required to meet uh, net zero. You need to offset your residual 10% of your emissions, but you should not wait until then. You should be focusing on that now as well. You should be helping um, wider global net zero goal. And I think what we've seen um, in the market is that many organizations are not actually acting quickly enough to plan this offsetting activity. They're waiting, they're delaying, they're saying, oh, we'll worry about that when we're closer to 2050. But there are a lot of reasons that Harry Parkin will uh, discuss uh, in a little bit more detail um, a little bit later on. Um, but the main focus of that is to mitigate exposure to extensive price and supply risks why you should be doing it now. But if we go to the next slide, it's not just the SBTI who are stating this. It is not just the SBTI that are recommending this. We are seeing this across multiple different organizations and there is a general consensus that one, carbon credits are necessary to achieve net zero. The focus, yes, should be on reducing your emissions, but you need to neutralize your re residual emissions at the end. And so we're seeing that from the SBTI, the Oxford Principles for Net Zero uh, Aligned Offsetting. We're seeing that within the UK's TPT, ISO guidance, UN, and even this week, we've seen the gold standard BVCM guidance be released, which again says that we need to be working towards that now. And the big focus of that is that, yes, 
net zero residual emissions offsetting using removals only, but we need to be helping the wider globe to reduce their emissions to deliver global progress towards net zero, uh, supporting the economic, social and environmental factors to help reduce those GHG emissions. But there's some other um, very important aspects of all of the guidance that we have seen be released. Um, and that is that all BVCM mitigation outcomes should be verified by an independent third party. And I think that's really, in, um, really important. And as John uh, mentioned at the top of the meeting, is that how do you demonstrate that what you're doing is actually correct? It is um, high integrity, is high quality. And that is that verified by an independent third party um, against uh, high quality carbon standards. So it's someone else confirming that you're doing it correctly. It is against a, um, an established standard. But there's also something else interesting within these documents as well. And I think this leads me on to my uh, next topic, which is on the, the next slide. Um, but that is about public reporting. Um, and so all of the guidances recommend annual public reporting on all BVCM activities, investments, outcomes, including verification statements and certificates. So on this on this slide, you'll see we've got the UN, we've got ISO, TPT, we've got SEC, CDP. We're also omitting other ones, CSRD and a lot of other acronyms out there that are requiring more information to be provided. Some of them global, some um, specific geographies, some voluntary, some mandatory, and some transitioning between them. But what we're seeing is um, a big movement away from just saying, we're offsetting, we're planting some trees, we're doing this. It's saying, okay, great. What are you doing? Where are you doing it? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? How do we know that you're doing it robustly? How we, do we know we, you're doing it correctly? And so on, on, on the right hand side, some of the kind of key implications that we're saying here. Um, so the number of credits um, that are being purchased and retired in a year, the type of credits, uh, what type of GHG emissions are being kind of covered by said credits, what registry are they being held in? um and uh what is the project source when was the carbon credit created um uh, the use of that credit is it being used to meet a specific claim whether that's carbon neutrality net zero whatever that might be or is it a wider um kind of claim that um, is relevant to your organization it needs to be specific and you need to back it up with that action and it comes down to that final point again that third party verification or certification scheme that the credits was subject to. So what checks have been uh, put in place to ensure that credit was created, that removal, avoidance or reduction actually happened and who checked it where. And I think that all of these aspects go into the requirement of what makes uh, um, a, a high quality carbon credit, but the transparency to be able to explain that, to back up any claims that you've got, that's where these um, disclosure requirements are really coming into their own. So I think all organizations need to be aware of this um, when setting an offsetting strategy and making any type of claim. But if we can go to the next slide, um, so I wanted to kind of go over the, the, the first parts and then finish with how to ensure that your offsetting activity stands up to scrutiny. And there's a few different aspects of that. So there's complying with market best practice, policies, science-based guidance, and, and the other words that are at the top of the screen. But the first part is to demonstrate long-term vision, essentially set a net zero target. But within that target, we need to be developing short term goals and temporary steps that are going to help us achieve that net zero target, essentially a transition plan. How are we going to get there? What are we going to be doing to achieve net zero? What is that long term vision? That is the first port of call that needs to be established. But second up, this needs to be backed by action. So what are you doing? Where are you doing it? Why are you doing it? How well is it going? That needs to be um, provided. 
And then you can back that up using claims to demonstrate sustained efforts on a path consistent with that long-term vision, with that net zero target. What are you doing to achieve it? How well is it going? But if you are going to claim anything um, the, um, around these targets, transparency is key. So um, what, uh, yeah, so our main recommendation here when we're looking at transparency is what are you doing? Where are you doing? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? Follow a recognized methodology, a recognized standard. Don't just say we're offsetting. Say we are offsetting using this sta a standard endorsed by this organization, verified by this organization to do whatever you are trying to achieve with it. And it's really essential there to not mix up your long-term objectives with short-term achievements when, cho when choosing claims and when claiming something um, within that wider reporting. And if we click on to the last part, the regulation and policy awareness is a really key and important factor of this. So organizations and companies should always abide by local laws when formulating public claims. So we're seeing a lot of movement in this area at the moment. We're seeing France's regulation on neutrality claims. We're seeing the EU's incoming green claims directive. Within the UK, we're seeing the um, advertising guidance on what you can and can't say in relation to products. All organizations should be aware of what you can and can't say. If you are going to claim something, if you are going to um, engage in these activities, you need to back that up. You need to be transparent, back it up by action and make it part of the bigger picture of where you are starting and where you are going. So that was a whirlwind um, of what kind of goes into it. But I'm going to hand over to Harry Parkin now, who's going to take us through how to develop a credible carbon offsetting strategy. Thank you, Zander. Um, amazing. So we, we've heard from Zander that there is consensus on the use of carbon credits, um, both in terms of their role for net zero itself and also um, kind of the interim target side of things. So for example, if your organization has got a, um, a carbon neutrality target on the way to net zero, um, there's a role both for the um, the net zero neutralization side of things and also the beyond value chain mitigation, which is kind of where that, that neutrality um, commitment would fit in. And what we know is that carbon credits um, in themselves cannot be used for reducing emissions. But where carbon credits are used outside of your organization's value chain, you're able to compensate for those um, emissions, which otherwise wouldn't have been wouldn't have been possible um, to do. And ultimately, um, what we know from what Zander said um, and from that, that SBT um, trajectory diagram that he had at the beginning is that ultimately carbon credits will be required um, to be purchased by your organization if you have a net zero commitment or you're considering setting a net zero target. Um, so what I want to do in this section really is to um, just dive into essentially how we um, go about developing a credible offsetting strategy. What does that look like um, for, for your organization? And, you know, this is, I imagine, one of the questions that um, your your team will have, um, uh, you know, the, the, the context that you have at your company is, okay, great, we know we need to buy some carbon credits. How do we do that? When do we do that? Um, you know, how do we go about doing that? So um, what we're just saying on this slide here, first of all, um, is that there is we need to have an awareness that there is um, a market at play here. So as much as we know we need carbon credits, um, it's not just a case of, you know, if they're available on a shelf, you can go and buy them tomorrow and, you know, jobs are good and box ticks. Um, it's a moving market. We have dynamics at play, um, you know, kind of classic economics of supply and demand, um, but, you know, price is, is changing as well over time and, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And unlike um, other kind of more commoditized markets, um, it's a little bit less kind of cut and dry where price is kind of driven from. So we need to be aware that, as I say, um, price of different carbon credits changes over time. Um, and that is driven by a number of different factors. Um, what that can mean is that price exposure is quite a big challenge um, for your net zero commitment. So if you have kind of a significant amount of uh, residual emissions that you're expecting at net zero, 
um, you can expect to be um, essentially spending quite a lot of kind of company capital on sourcing those carbon credits. Um, so what we want to kind of help walk you through and help your organization with is thinking through what, you know, how can we manage that risk and how can we um, kind of mitigate the, um, the price exposure that we've got there. And I, like my personal perspective and ours at, at EcoAct is get started on it as soon as possible. Begin um, work on your offsetting strategy today um, for your long-term commitments. Um, and that will kind of be, uh, you know, will be a, a prudent decision ultimately. Um, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about um, two different markets. Um, so the spot market, which is essentially the, the credits that are available today. Um, and also kind of more of a project investment side of things. So that's where we um, put capital up front to, to um, get new projects up and running, essentially. Um, and there's a little bit of a difference between the two, which we'll, we'll touch on a little bit more. Uh, if we could just jump on to the next slides. Great. So what um, we want to just make clear, first of all, um, is that we have different types of credits and all of them play a really important role in the journey to net zero. Um, it's really important to recognize that, you know, as, as Murray kind of touched on with the science at the beginning, um, carbon credits are a really important tool in the wider toolkit of um, levers that we can use to, to um, take responsibility for our organization's emissions. Um, you know, essentially, if we've got a, um, you know, we talk about a hierarchy of actions of measure your emissions, reduce your emissions amount offsets. And as you reduce your emissions over time, there is still the area underneath that curve that needs to be compensated for. And we see a real role of different um, types of credits um, for different parts of that journey. So particularly kind of the carbon removals credits, as we know from the SPCI guidance, um, is needed to neutralize your, your emissions from a point of net zero. But actually carbon reduction and avoidance credits, which are um, those where uh, carbon is essentially stopped from going into the atmosphere in, in the first place. Um, can also play a really important role as well. Um, but what we again need to be thinking through is just that kind of market side of it where actually you need to know the amount of volume of credits that you're going to be required to buy that year. Um, and you need to know where that's going to be sourced from. And what we'll touch on a little bit later is actually that, especially with the, um, the longer term project development side of things, there's often kind of a lag time of five or 10 years before you can even get your hands on those credits. Um, so it's really worth thinking through what you can do today. Um, we've got a couple of points on the right hand side there just around the cost of inaction. Um, so first of all, um, we think that, you know, investing strategically, you are able to secure that long term supply. And that takes away the risk of you getting to net zero. And actually, there are no carbon removals credits left. Um, that is obviously a risk for a variety of reasons. First of all, you know, there's a price risk there. If there are any credits available, you're going to be spending a lot of money on them, but also kind of more of a reputational side as well. If you've made a, a commitment to net zero that you've been kind of chasing after for, for potentially 30, 40 years, you don't want to get to net zero and suddenly you find that despite all of your best efforts to reduce emissions and maybe you've even achieved that target of reducing emissions by 90% or so, you actually can't meet net zero because there aren't the carbon credits there to, to actually support that. So we think that's a really important reason for, for getting started now with your offset strategy. Um, the other thing is also the price side of things. Um, so um, we've done a little bit of analysis at Equite um, that suggests that um, strategic offsetting could potentially reduce annual offsetting costs by up to 90%. Um, and there is a lot of different things driving that, um, but essentially it's you know thinking through different procurement mechanisms, when are you buying those carbon credits? Um, and essentially averaging that over time um, can lead to pretty significant um, savings in costs, um, which, you know, is is the thing that ultimately will, will turn the dial ultimately on the, on the balance sheet as opposed to the uh, within a sustainability team. Um, so just kind of factor that in um, over the next couple of slides. What I want to do now as we just bounce onto the next slides um, is just talk through essentially uh, our five-step framework and what we would recommend your organization thinks through um, when you go about setting your own um, carbon offsetting strategy. The first point um, that I would really you know, recommend thinking through is, is the education piece. And this is often an overlooked um, part of the journey. Um, you know, I think it's really important that when you're thinking about the kind of levels of expenditure on the CapEx and OpEx side as, as 
we will often be seeing um, in kind of big offsetting strategies. Um, there needs to be an understanding across the company, but particularly kind of C-suite level, that it could cost quite a little bit of, quite, well, quite a lot of money. Um, and, you know, that is ultimately um, something that, you know, if you're a CFO, you're going to be wanting to understand. Um, so we'd always recommend that all stakeholders that are involved in um, the decision-making process for carbon credits um, are aware of their role um, and what that kind of means for the organization in terms of costs. Thinking through kind of the um, perspective of risk as well, that's a, an important part, but also just kind of the carbon offsetting 101, like understanding the mechanisms of how, of how offsetting works. The next, um, the second and third sections we've got here are assess and define. Um, and these are kind of slightly banded together, but essentially once we've got all of those key stakeholders on the same level, um, on the same page and up to speed with, um, you know, talking about offsetting and understanding how it works and its role in meeting that net zero commitment. Um, it's about assessing what will work best for your organization. So, you know, it might be the case for your, for your organization, actually you've got a really low risk appetite. Um, you've got a limited budget, but you want to kind of support projects that are within your operational geographies to kind of allow for that um, potentially that comms piece or um, in alignment with other um, objectives that you've got at your organization. Um, do you want your offsetting activity to have additional kind of benefits for sustainable development? Um, is it, as I say, a specific country or budget that you have in mind? Um, or, you know, is it something different? And actually establishing what matters to your company, what are the deal breakers with carbon credit sourcing? Um, it's really important to kind of define up front. As we begin to think through, yeah, that definition side of things, um, that's where kind of thinking through what might work from a procurement point of view um, and, you know, what the, what the kind of key drivers are from a, a risk and, and budget management point of view um, would be. We'd recommend essentially thinking through some, you know, scenario modeling that we would, um, that, you know, you look into different scenarios of how, um, price projections and su supply might look over future years and you know of course um there's the caveat there of course but we, you know it's a market we don't know where the price is going to go necessarily but what we can see um is where kind of demand is coming from and you know as a result you know some form of scenario modeling um is a really good idea to think through where those kind of key um expenditure points are where the pinch points might be so for example um, if there's a moment in your offsetting journey where actually you are, you know, getting started with developing your own project, but you won't have those credits issued for five or 10 years, where do the credits come from in the meantime? Um, actually beginning to understand that is a really important part of this process. And that kind of then translates into the quantify section. So um, we would always recommend um, a, like a modeling phase. Um, so taking those scenarios and actually then modeling out the numbers out to and beyond your your net zero point. Um, as I say, you know, this is an imprecise science. It's indicative. It helps you to, to gauge an idea of magnitude of, of spend and what is needed and, and um, even kind of things like human resource, like where do we um, where do we kind of get that uh, resource from? Um, thinking about through now is is you know a really kind of wise wise decision. The way that we do that at EcoAct um, is we use kind of feeder inputs from multiple different reputable sources. So um, loads of different organizations um, kind of come together and say, you know, this is where we predict price to go based on what we've seen in the past. Um, and we use different models from different third party reports um, and databases to do that. Um, something that EcoAct does as well, which I think is a really important thing um, when your organization thinks through kind of modeling out emissions is, um, EcoAct is a project developer. We understand how to develop projects um, and we are a retailer of credits as well. So we can actually have visibility on what the market is doing today rather than just kind of relying solely on a report from a um, from past. And with all of those four points coming together, um, we then essentially have that strategy point. Um, so with all of those inputs, um, it's about defining what your strategy looks like. And that might, be involved, I might involve kind of making renewed commitments um, it might be an internal document in terms of, you know, this is how we're going to go about procuring credits. These are the deal breakers that we've got when we go um, tender for, for new um, carbon credits for our journey to, to net zero. Um, but essentially, it's about risk mitigation. It's about understanding your journey to net zero from a carbon credit usage point of view. Uh, if we could just jump on to the next slide. 
Thank you. Um, so this is just, uh, I think something that is really important um, with, with carbon offsetting is that it's not just about carbon, um, which might be a surprise to some people, but um, you know, offsetting is a really, really great mechanism that we can use to actually bring uh, you know, benefits beyond just you know, we've, we've met our net zero commitment. Um, it can really align to the sustainable development goals um, set by the United Nations. Um, you know, for example, with a clean cooking project, you know, you're improving health, potentially providing um, new jobs for, for people producing stoves, um, often as kind of gender equality um, advantages as well. And, you know, this is a really important thing to think through is that actually, can you um, use your offsetting strategy to um, bring development um, beyond just, you know, the carbon the carbon output of, of those projects? Um, and I think uh, it'll be useful now to to hand over to uh, to Elisa on on the kind of more specific um, example of one of Ecoat's carb projects, and I'm sure she can talk you through a little bit more around that. Thank you, Harry. Hello, everyone. Um, so, as part of the project development team, the Blue Carbon Cluster focuses on the design and structuring of high quality investment ready carbon projects in the coastal and marine ecosystems. I will present today one of ECOACT's nature-based solution portfolio and walk you through its positive impacts, not only to climate, but also to community and biodiversity. So let me first introduce you what Blue Carbon is and why it is considered an efficient nature-based solution to climate change. Through photosynthesis, primary producers in tidal wetlands like mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses actively remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the green parts as any other plant. When this ecosystem is healthy, photosynthesis, the arrows in, highly exceeds respiration, the arrows out, so they are capable of producing excess organic carbon and sequester it in the sediment below. Carbon sequestration here is further enhanced by the water flow and tides, impeding remineralization and maintaining carbon in these soils for millennia. Even if tidal wetlands occupy only a fraction of the total global coastline, they account for 50% of the total carbon burial in ocean settings. Healthy coastal ecosystems are also known to provide other important goods and services to communities. They are habitat and nursery grounds to many species. They protect local communities from coastal hazards, and they provide uh, cultural services such as uh, ecotourism and education. And so they are intimately related to climate mitigation, adaptation, food security, and local livelihoods. Despite these services, we are losing them too quickly. Mangroves are disappearing at an average annual rate of 0.13%, and they are expected to decline further due to interconnected drivers, including deforestation, pollution, and climate change. Many of the world's remaining mangroves are degraded and fragmented, and this is where the health, eco the health condition of the ecosystem uh, matters. When degraded, wetlands not only halt their functionality and provisioning of services, but when soil, soil is altered, the stored carbon is re-emitted to the atmosphere, becoming a source of greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. Sundari means beautiful in Bengali, and it is also the name of the first mangrove restoration project developed by Equac in partnership with a local startup called Menso. The project aims to restore 4,000 hectares of urban degraded mangroves and degraded tidal mudflats inside the project area of more than 260,000 hectares in the Sunderbans. The Sunderbans is the largest mangrove forest in the world. It is located in the delta region of the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Menga rivers in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and it is served by the state of West Bengal in India and Southern Bangladesh. The Sunderbans is known for its rich uh, biodiversity and unique ecosystem, making it an important natural habitat for various species of flora and fauna. Governments have uh, conserved part of the Sunderbans mangrove forest as a national park and created three sanctuaries to stop degradation of mangrove lands. But this is not enough. Being one of the most densely populated areas in India, Sunderbans mangroves bear the pressure of human development and land encroachment. 
on top of it, the Sunderbans is facing very aggressive coastal erosion processes, uh, flooding farmlands and houses triggered by the land change, climate change, and sea level rise. Some Icelanders have already been relocated by the government, becoming one of the first climate migrants in the world. Sander is entirely community-based and was designed in close relationship with the local communities who are well aware of the value of their money. Next slide, please. Sander is meant to be validated in 2024 by Vera's verified carbon standard, VCS, and is expecting to remove more than 4 million tons of CO2 equivalent from the atmosphere along the 20 years of crediting period. The project aimed to first restore degraded areas by a combination of hydrological restoration, locally managed nurseries, and site-specific plantation with nature species outside of the government project area protected areas. Second, reduce degradation threats by conducing capital, capacity building with local communities and improving sustainable local livelihoods. And third, all combined with best-in-class remote and field monitoring of the net carbon stock changes, biodiversity gains, and socioeconomic impacts. The project is structured as a group project, which means that it will be split in two phases or instances. The first instance is about to finish the plantation work with over 450 hectares of the degraded mudflats planted. That means that more than 1.5 million trees already planted, with the participation of more than 400 families in all the uh, all the activities. The rest of the project area belongs to the second instance to be launched in uh, 2024. And uh, those are just some of the SDGs that the project is um, uh, meant to uh, trigger. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Elisa, for giving us that taste of, of our carbon, uh, our blue carbon project. Now, we have received a few questions in, in the chat. Some of those we are doing our best to answer uh, answer them in writing. Um, I think there is one that I wanted to uh, to bring on uh, for, for the benefit of the rest of the audience. We received one um, asking um, maybe this is going to be for you, Harry. It says, um, for some of us who are just starting on our journey, um, I believe is towards net zero, towards net zero journey, what are the first steps um, that we should take to ensure we are on the right path? And, and a, how can carbon offsetting fit, fit into those strategies? Okay, thank you, Marie. Um, yeah, so I guess the first thing that I would say um, is that, you know, offsetting is never the only solution. It's not a silver bullet to um, solving climate change in, in, in one go kind of thing. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's really important to go back to that hierarchy of actions of, um, you know, measuring emissions, reducing emissions, then offsetting emissions afterwards. Um, reduction essentially needs to be a priority um before before the offsetting side of things but um you know as i mentioned earlier like there is there is a curve on the way to net zero like you will decarbonize over time as, as you between 2024 and 2050 but that means that there are you know inevitably residual emissions that can't be um reduced today um, and that is where a really important part of, of the story is and uh, where carbon offsetting ultimately fits in. Because, you know, even though you're reducing emissions over time, there's no point waiting until 2050 to, to um, you know, that, then start offsetting. But actually, if you um, take responsibility for today's emissions by purchasing carbon credits, even as you're reducing emissions over time, I think that's, you know, um, a really important step that you can do, um, you can do today. I think the other thing I'd say um, is that there is, you know, ultimately an expectation um, from both from customers, if it's kind of a B2C company um, or investors, um, ultimately, who are expecting, you know, green credentials, sustainability credentials from organizations. And, um, you know, ultimately, if you're reducing emissions over the next 30 years, you're not, you're not necessarily going to have, um, you know, good progress updates consistently every, you know, every, every 
um, year or so. Obviously, it'd be good to, to have that kind of released in annual reporting, that kind of thing. But um, purchasing credits today is a really good way to demonstrate your organization's commitment to um, to carbon um, and to, you know, for, for reducing emissions side of things. Um, I hope that answers the question, but yeah, happy to take that one offline uh, for yeah whoever asked that one. Thanks so much, Harry. Um, uh, there is a second question um, uh, related to over-the-counter derivatives to hedge price risk of carbon. Um, I think I can address that. So there are different um, instruments, uh, different uh, credits that we will find uh, in in the market. So we will find credits that are um, over the counter, so they are ready readily available for uh, for companies or individuals to purchase. There is a second category uh, which is focusing on projects that are ready to go and they just need a little bit more of investment to be um, fully uh, deployed and scaled up. And there's a third option which is developing a project from scratch. I would say there is no uh, secret recipe um, to 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 manage uh, or hedge uh, those um, those uh, price increases for carbon credits. It's more identifying what is the best approach for a company and how is that going to be reflected in in their in their strategies. Uh, as Harry says, it is better to understand what are the goals, what are the targets, but also what's the budget available to, uh, to in order to define which um, what is the different combination of those of those instruments and and the role that they are going to play in a, in a strategy. Um, so something that we do at EcoAct is based on those targets, based on that budget and the volume that is needed, we are able to identify um, what are the best ways to maximize that budget and to uh, reach a, a higher impact, whether it is um, investing early on in projects that secure a long-term stream of carbon credits, whether it is through um, a long-term agreement, or whether it would be by developing a, a project uh, um, uh, for, the, for the company. So uh, I would say it's not one single um, one single. Uh, aspect that we consider is a combination of many um, that should be integrated into a company strategy. Um, so let's move uh, on to the next question. And I think Elisa, this is, uh, this is something for you. Um, how are projects tracked and reported on? Um, can we track performance of our projects? And, and I believe they're referring to those carbon projects that are developed uh, from scratch. Sure, thank you. So, um, so I guess uh, this is where the third party uh, auditors uh, gets uh, in the in the scheme. Um, so first of all, uh, every carbon project needs to be a design and design and structure according to a certain um, standard and a certain uh, methodology. So, uh, in order for the project to be considered validated and, 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 and start issuing credits, um, the developer needs to conduct a, a third party validation uh, where um, items like um, additionality, baseline, uh, leakage, uh, and eligibility to the standard are, are, are checked. Once that step is 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 is, is fulfilled and, to and, and, and the third party uh, auditor Make sure that um, uh, the project, uh, the, the project that you are presenting, uh, is 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 is, is um, eligible uh, for the standard. Um, the credit period uh, uh, can can let's say start. From there, the issuing uh, schedule is up to the developer. Uh, you can issue, you can put credits on the market uh, as frequent as you basically want. In order to do that, you first need to monitor uh, your carbon stock change, your change in net carbon uh, in, in, inside your project, how much the carbon stocks in your project have evolved due to your activities. And uh, based on that monitoring report, a third party audit is, uh, audit is conducted to verify that indeed you have um, stored uh, as many uh, carbon as you uh, have claimed. If the verification report is positive, uh, your project can be considered uh, verified at this point and you can start issue you can issue those uh, credits into the market. So that will be uh, 
for the, uh, for, let's say for the carbon. On top of all that, um, uh, at least in EQUAT project, we implement also um, a other type of baseline and monitorings, like biodiversity, for example. We make sure that uh, uh, at least the blue carbon projects uh, include a, a biodiversity baseline and, uh, and uh, monitoring uh, for biodiversity and also for socioeconomic uh, impact. So that will be, uh, like, let's say the ch the cherry on the cake uh, for the um, for the carbon credit. Thanks, uh, thanks, Elisa. Um, there is another um, question. Um, how do you know what a fair price of carbon credit is? Does it depend on the quality of the credit? Is there a source where you can find the market cost of credits? Sander, um, I think this one might be for you. Sure, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone's got some comments on on this one. Um, a fair price of a carbon credit. Um, there are multiple different aspects which are going to con contribute to the value of that carbon credit. Um, and we usually um, kind of put it into a few different things. Um, there, it depends on the carbon standard that you are using, the project type, um, the time and date that that credit has been created. When was it created? Um, is it of um, a endorsed standard? Um, ICRO endorsed standards generally kind of fetch a slightly higher price. Um, the quality of a credit does impact the value of it in summary, um, but there are a lot of kind of smaller individual aspects within it um, that do impact it. Um, and as for a source of where you find the market costs of credits, um, there are multiple different uh, sources out there. There's some public and some paid, um, which uh, we can kind of provide um, guidance on um, at a later date. Um, but Harry, Murray, or Elisa, do you have any other comments to add in there on, on that question? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I think other uh, other factor that influences the cost uh, as well of the carbon credits are the labor costs and, and where is a project uh, being developed. So we know that there are regions in which uh, the cost for developing a project is going to be more expensive because we not only factor um, the cost of the land, but also salaries, who is going to be working on that project, who is going to benefit from that project, all of those aspects uh, and, and who's going to benefit from that project is a particularly relevant thing, uh, which is a benefit sharing scheme that all carbon projects have, uh, especially those that work directly with communities. Um, that, those are the elements that are incorporated into every carbon project business plan and therefore influence at the end of the day the price that those credits will have in the market. Also, let's, let's not forget that the voluntary carbon market operates in a supply demand dynamic as well. So there are specific types of projects and, and, and that are highly valued um, and compared to others. Um, we have seen uh, those projects fetching higher prices are those that have additional co-benefits, uh, not only meeting SDGs, but also incorporating elements of biodiversity, for example. Um, so there are many different, different factors. Um, it's not necessarily um, it, that quality is the only element, uh, really. It, 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 we need to take a lot of things in, in, into account. Um, in the interest uh, of time, there is um, one, um, another question. Um, so, Harry, um, what are the, uh, can you reiterate what are the different types of, of carbon credits? Is there a credit that is, are those equally important uh, or should we focus on some credits more than other? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think in terms of um, one being more important than the other, I think, you know, as long as it's verified by a robust certification standard, a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon, right? So you're paying for a certificate that says a ton of carbon has been either reduced, um, avoided or or removed. Um, I guess those are the different different types of, um, of carbon credit. Ultimately, they kind of fit within those 
two to three kind of umbrella terms of carbon removals and carbon avoidance or reduction on one side. Um, in terms of meeting net zero, um, carbon removals are, are required. That's kind of the best thinking, best practice thinking from the likes of the SPTI. Um, but in terms of the journey to net zero, um, there's a really important role for for carbon avoidance. And um, you know, I would I would really encourage any organisation thinking about offsetting today or on the way to net zero um, to be considering you know what can be done to to avoid carbon being emitted in the first place. And that might be things like forest protection. Um, clean cooking that we you know mentioned earlier on, um, things like water filters or uh, kind of even some things like um, household level renewables and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know, Marie Zander, if you would add anything on that, um, but I think you know from my perspective, it's you know just make sure that you're guaranteeing the quality, and apart from that, it's you know a ton of carbon, a ton of carbon. Thanks, Harry. And I think we have uh, we have a couple of minutes for uh, a last uh, question. Um, it says, given the scrutiny around carbon offsetting projects, what criteria should companies use to evaluate the integrity and effectiveness of potential projects? Uh, or credits. Um, so I, I think we briefly covered uh, those aspects a little bit when we were talking about uh, the price as well. Um, so there are basic principles that all carbon projects must follow. So all carbon projects must be additional, uh, must be uh, permanent, verifiable, measurable. The credits must be unique, which means uh, credits are only going to be used one for a uh, by one entity and cannot be a double a double use or double counted. Um, so one of the most important elements of, of carbon credits is that these carbon credits are um, are generated in following a, the methodology uh, approved methodologies by those carbon standards um, and um, in order to be certified. Um, then a, among all those elements, what it's important to consider is the baseline, what Elisa was talking about. Um, what are we considering? What is Where is the data coming from? How are we estimating uh, the baseline of that project? And then what are the, what's the process that is being followed uh, for addressing leakage? So um, understanding if the activity that has been developed is actually not causing uh, harm in other areas uh, by shifting the activity or by encouraging um, uh, communities, for example, to move uh, from one place to another. And if we were talking about uh, preventing deforestation, that we are actually protecting one area, but moved to another area to um, to conduct economic activities that we were doing, that they were doing before. Um, so I would say uh, focusing on those main, those main elements, the permanence uh, of the project, the avoidance of leakage, the baseline, but also if a project is stating uh, further support uh, or further support for communities or benefits beyond carbon, that those uh, benefits are actually um, confirmed and th that are being monitored and that an effective engagement with the community has happened. So in that we have consent uh, as well for, from the communities to to uh, to develop that project. I hope that's, uh, that answers um, that question. Um, we are about to wrap up. Um, we are at the top of the hour. Um, Thank you um, so much um, for joining us today. Um, John, I don't know if you would like to say a few wrap-up uh, words to the audience. No, just thanks Thanks so much to the ECOAC team. This was really informative, a lot of great Q&A and, and uh, dialogue there. So yeah, I appreciate you taking us through it. Everyone can see on the, uh, the screen here at the contacts, Please do reach out for further one-on-one -on -one questions. Uh, I'm sure the team is, is happy to field those. And thanks so much.